Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends in the cyber community, welcome to the workshop day of the 13th International Conference on Cyber Conflict with the theme Going Viral. My name is Henrik Beckwart. And my name is Lina Lumista. This is the first time that we are conducting SICON as an online event. And even though virtually, we have been looking forward to this day for a long time. The program for today consists of a virtual book launch of the book Autonomous Cyber Capabilities Under International Law on stage one, and workshops with Fortinet and Leonardo on stage two. For joining the two workshops, simply click on your preferred option, stage one or two, on the right of your screen. But without further ado, we give the word to Ms. Anne Valjataga on stage one, and Lieutenant Colonel Franz Landenhammer on stage two, and wish you a fruitful workshop day. Hello, dear friends, ladies, gentlemen, and colleagues, excellencies, and first and foremost, the contributors to this volume that's we, that we are going to present right now. Mm. We are honored to present an edited volume titled Autonomous Cyber Capabilities Under International Law. The volume consists of 13 chapters exploring in, uh, in detail how autonomous cyber capabilities are viewed through the lens of international, in, international law. And it comes as a follow-up to the, a working paper mm, bearing the same title, which was published in 2019. Speaking of the working paper, then uh, here I would like to uh, bring your attention to the fact that uh, the working paper would never have seen light without uh, the um, without the enthusiasm and uh, the triggering power and force of Miss um, Maria Nagel, who was also alongside Professor Rain Livoja and me, one of the co-authors then. So the, Maria is truly the person behind the scenes of this project. Um, but just as the work pa working paper back then, uh, this book also explores, uh, but on an entirely different new level of uh, uh, detail and complexity, questions such as what do um, sovereignty, accountability, responsibility, due diligence, culpability, and uh, intent or knowledge mean at a point where autonom autonomous technologies meet cyber operations. Quite ironically, so far, the two conversations have uh, run on um, in parallel but not convergent tracks, even though technically one might say that the first ever truly autonomous weapon system, or also the perhaps most notorious uh, piece of malware ever to existed, Stuxnet, was in fact a software that could be classified as uh, an autonomous cyber capability. Mm. Even though we are forced to hold this event here virtually at the moment, mm. and we definitely would prefer to do it so that there would be a table, and around the table we would have all the 17 authors, it is still a great achievement to our centre and uh, to at least the Estonian legal community to have this book published in Estonia. And um, um, due to the circumstances that we are all too, um, too well aware of, we also were forced to hold three workshops during autumn time, also virtually. And there the authors demonstrated um, wonderful degree of uh, involvement, not only to their own work, but also with the works of the other authors. And uh, it truly turned out in a way that uh, the authors became the best reviewers, sometimes the harshest critics, and the best supporters for each other, which 
made the work of the editors not really hard, quite easy and pleasant, to be honest. And uh, as a result, I think that we have uh, published a book that, uh, in a way, can be described as a niche product, since the technologies uh, described there, mm, hypothetical and real alike, are not the ones that uh, define the standard used in practice right now. They are sometimes um, rather futuristic. But uh, even though, for me at least, it turned out to be that uh, autonomy serves as a wonderful catalyst for all the well-known problematics of uh, international law as applied to cyber operations. Therefore, despite its uh, density and richness of thought, mm, it is not a mere legalistic exercise of uh, academic thought and uh, scholarly dialogue, but uh, it is our true hope that it also serves as a valuable compass to practitioners, students, technologists, and everyone with a healthy degree of curiosity in all things related to law and new technologies. Mm. This book uh, owes its existence also to our language editor, Miss Isabel Biert, and uh, uh, to Miss Agnes Rattas from Design Studio, 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 who gave uh, a form to all these ideas. Mm. Also, the ASTA process turned out to be slightly more isolated and lonelier than initially expected. Mm. It, was, um, it was a true gem to have uh, a working environment uh, as warm, um, diverse and uh, inspiring as the one that has been cultivated by our head of uh, legal branch, Miss Kadri Gaska, to whom I'm now happy to give words so that she could uh, put the book in the broader context of the previous work of the center. Thank you and Kadri, welcome. Thank you very much, Anne. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends of Saikon, dear colleagues, I am delighted to give a few introductory uh, remarks at this event, which for us is actually the conclusion of a three-year uh, journey on the topic of the uh, legal aspects of autonomy. And if experience of the past is any good for predicting future these days, because the days are indeed odd, uh, it is, uh, we, we hope, one step into more informed and rational discussion uh, with actionable outcomes, at least for, uh, for our uh, CCD, COE community, our community of nations, and uh, uh, Western like-minded liberal democracies uh, as well. I'm sincerely inspired, I must say, by the work done by uh, my dear colleague and CCD, COE uh, researcher, Ann Väljadaga, uh, Professor uh, Rain Livoja, who has been our good collaboration partner for, uh, for several years, and to each of the dozen uh, authors of the book who labored over translating law into complex technology uh, and back, uh, shared their findings uh, with each other, debated the contents of the, of the book with other authors. Uh, and the result is a contribution that uh, brings together the legal research done on uh, cyber operations and on autonomy. And of course, for the CCD COE community of nations, uh, the study helps uh, national and NATO legal advisors and policymakers to understand the legal uh, obligations, constraints, and responsibilities uh, involved in cyber operations using uh, autonomous features. So, as uh, Anne very well said, uh, when uh, studying the legal debates on the issues of autonomy and cyber operations, you will see that the work has uh, uh, occurred in largely parallel strands with far fewer encounters uh, between them than, uh, than one would imagine. 
on the one hand, that there, there is the very, uh, very visible, very active discussion uh, concerning states' uh, conduct in cyberspace, uh, the states' practice of cyber operations, for which both uh, legal practice is tangibly accumulating and legal research abounds. Uh, demonstrated not least by the CCD COE uh, initiated and, and hosted Tallinn Manual uh, project, but also uh, through states' recent activity in expressing their official positions, uh, responding to cyber operations, malicious cyber activities by means of pub public attributions, sanctions, etc., and through the variety of intergovernmental and multi stakeholder fora that uh, discuss these matters. And then the other uh, uh, sort of strand of discussion concerns its uh, complicated little brother, uh, which neither policymakers nor scholars have uh, uh, considered as something or, or someone of too much of their own yet. And that's the issue of autonomous military systems, their development and deployment and containment, which have, I'd say, not been through, uh, put through the, the um, demystification process somewhat understandably given the uh, complexity and obscurity of the topic. And debates over autonomous weapon systems have been more focused on the containing the killer drones themselves than the actual state use, including conscious human uh, judgment and control. Yet both of those issues share the same uh, technological and strategic and, uh, and legal environment. And given that the uh, digital and cyber development in general uh, involves an, an uh, somehow inherent uh, drive towards more automation, autonomous functionalities, it is of course no surprise that uh, this tendency spills over to weapons development, military systems and capabilities. And uh, as policy developers and uh, legal advisors, we cannot to choose the menu here anymore. That sort of era is past. Uh, the meal is already being prepared for us in the, in the kitchens. These uh, topics land on our table sooner rather than later. Uh, for, as for CCD's, uh, CCD COE's work on the issue, uh, we did, after several attempts, uh, which were admittedly met with uh, little enthusiasm even uh, from our own member nations, uh, the CCD COE took on a first research project on international law and autonomous capabilities uh, in 2018, and uh, Anne gave you an overview into the evolution of the, of the discussion as, uh, as three seen from where we stand uh, last year. No, that in this sort of fluid era that we now live in, actually more time has passed. In 2019, we published an exploratory working paper on these issues uh, called the Autonomous Cyber Capabilities Under International Law. Uh, and with uh, two of its three authors uh, being on this physical or virtual uh, stage uh, today. And these uh, Addressed, or this report addressed the issues of defensive and offensive autonomous cyber capabilities. What are the criteria to determine when the use of automated or, or autonomous means results in, uh, for example, a breach of sovereignty uh, or intervention by a state or the use of force? And how the principles of uh, international humanitarian law of distinction, proportionality or precautions must be factored in in autonomous decision making and what is the state's responsibility in such setting. The new volume presented today uh, goes wider and deeper into those issues, and we are happy to have, again, a few of, the, of its dozen authors on this virtual stage with us to explain the subjects and unpack the, the contents, the thinking and the, the findings for us today. Where we are today is that, yes, uh, states have uh, uh, confirmed the application of uh, existing international law to cyber operations and to the use of autonomous weapons systems. There is little doubt that the international law is both relevant and applicable to the use of cyber uh, capabilities, including autonomous capabilities. But autonomy does add complexity 
to, ex to the application of those existing rules. Even though it doesn't necessarily create legal vacuums or make existing rules obsolete or ineffective. But uh, like other major uh, technological advancements, autonomous cyber capabilities uh, do demand uh, new interpretations, rethinking, re asking uh, the questions of how the rules initially designed for an entirely different uh, circumstances and, uh, and technologies uh, are applicable, are to be applied today. And uh, if I may borrow from the book once more, there are some prepositions that drive and guide the legal analysis. Uh, four of them, namely. Autonomous ca capabilities are pursued because they can allow systems to outperform hum humans. They enable uh, greater speed, or, speed precision, uh, the ability to analyze large uh, data sets that humans are not uh, uh, capable of without the technology. So the same trait of being able to surpass human performance that me means that in these respects uh, it is not possible uh, to subject autonomous uh, systems to real-time human control. The human uh, is, to, to many extents, removed from the loop. And uh, actually uh, forcing or uh, trying to place the human back in the loop would degrade or defeat the whole purpose of the autonomous uh, functionality. Uh, on the other hand, human actors and states uh, can be held responsible for the consequences of using a special uh, or specific autonomous capability in those specific circumstances. Since humans and uh, states, unlike technology, are the legal actors who must comply with international law and therefore must understand the conduct and the rationale of the, of the machine. And therefore, our defense policy planners, our military commanders and their staff, including legal advisors, uh, cannot afford to not understand the fundamentals and uh, ask informed questions about the operation of uh, autonomous capabilities and know their own duties and responsibilities, despite their complexity. So this book uh, is offering a chance to ask wiser, more nuanced, more informed questions to comply with our international legal obligations and hence sustain the security and stability of the cyberspace that we all depend on. So I hope this uh, session and your reading of the book will be inspiring and enlightening. And with that, uh, I pass back the floor to Anne, who will introduce the panelists and, uh, and guide the the discussion is coming now. So, uh, on, I'm looking forward to, uh, to hearing the session. Uh, enjoy both on stage and, the, and in the audience. And thank you very much for, for being with us. Thanks. Thank you, Godri, for not only putting our work in the broader context of what the center does, but also in the broader context of what's going on in technology, law, and the strategy in the field, and how understanding autonomous cyber capabilities is um, perhaps becoming uh, inevitable, in a sense. So, um, to proceed, then uh, I would like to introduce uh, our distinguished panel, Mm, where each and every member is somehow involved with the book. Editors and authors. So, everybody's there, yeah? And uh, first, we have Professor Ryan Leevoya from University of Queensland, who serves as the lead editor of the book. Second, it's uh, Dr. Russell Buchan, who's uh, from the University of Sheffield and uh, authored a chapter about command responsibility. Third, we have Professor Thomas Bury from University of St. Gallen from, in Switzerland, and uh, his research or his contribution um, took a look into uh, how, uh, uh, how um, auto disembodied systems can be um, subjected to ethical evaluation 
And third, we have Professor Erik Jensen from uh, Brigham School of uh, University. And uh, his contribution um, pondered on uh, the actual alleged uh, inherent uh, uh, value of human judgment in, uh, um, in uh, applying uh, international humanitarian law when uh, using uh, uh, autonomous uh, capabilities or weapon systems, either kinetic or uh, uh, purely virtual. And, um, I'm uh, delighted to host the panel and uh, I'm trying to put some of my knowledge obtained as uh, the co-editor co in use. But uh, first and foremost, maybe it's a um, nice transition from, uh, from, from, from describing the genesis and, uh, um, and the story of the book. Um, but I would like to um, turn to Ryan Levoya right now and uh, ask about what was in fact um, the main question that uh, guided you on the way or inspired you to become the lead editor of this, uh, uh, this volume and um, mm, is it somehow related to your previous academic research or your experience in the mm, laws group of governmental experts or anything else that comes to your mind? So, uh, um, Ryan, please. Thanks, Anne, and thanks um, also, Kadri, for the very kind introductions and for the opportunity to speak today. Um, it's a regrettable that we, we can't meet in person, but, but it's all still good to have uh, a conversation around this book, and, and uh, I'm very pleased that you were able to uh, join us um, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, depending on where in the world you are. So the book really, the, the, the question that drove the book was uh, uh, a, an observed disconnect between the discussions around autonomous capabilities and uh, cyber capabilities. And at the time, the CCD COE had identified the development of artificial intelligence um, as a significant uh, concern uh, in the uh, context of cyber capabilities with potential implications for uh, the applicable law. Whereas uh, I had participated in the um, work of the group of governmental experts on lethal autonomous weapon systems, and observed there the fact that the discussion was entirely focused on kinetic capabilities. Uh, there was no reference to potential autonomy in cyber capabilities, despite the fact, as has already been mentioned, uh, the most autonomous cyber capability that the world has seen, um, Stuxnet is or was in fact um, a, a cyber capability. And um, it's all the more curious as a, uh, a discussion of cyber capabilities would be relevant to a conversation about autonomous weapon systems and for a number of reasons. On the one hand, there are certain legal uh, considerations that are the same for both types of capabilities, so autonomous kinetic capabilities um, and uh, cyber capabilities, which is that there are potentially quite significant concerns uh, about uh, attribution uh, of conduct. And this is a, an issue well known for uh, people operating in the, in the cyber domain, uh, but the same problem can arise in circumstances where potentially large numbers of uh, autonomous uh, systems are deployed uh, in, context, in, in conflicts. Um, and the other uh, consideration is a strategic one. Um, autonomous functionality in weapon systems is software-based. Uh, which means that it can potentially proliferate uh, very cheaply and, and quickly. And so it's a little bit curious as to why um, uh, cyber capabilities really haven't been looked at in the debates around uh, autonomous weapon systems. And, and I can come back to uh, uh, speculate about that. Um, but but th this, I think, was, was what drove uh, uh, the project um, and also the lack of uh, scholarly attention to uh, autonomous cyber capabilities uh, from, a, from a legal perspective was uh, an important consideration. So we hope that we could trigger something of a discussion with our working paper uh, and then invite um, experts in various fields along to 
uh, engage with that paper uh, and develop and contribute their own thinking around some of the issues that we identified or potentially other issues uh, that our contributors identified. Thank you very much. And uh, indeed, the major issue was that while uh, kinetic autonomous capabilities tend to be the hot topic and cyber operations tend to be a hot topic as well, but the conversations rarely merge, then um, um, we came to the wonderful idea that uh, uh, perhaps uh, it should be tested whether uh, disembodied capabilities can be evaluated according to the same models that are applied to uh, mm, kinetic systems. So, um, and for this we in invited uh, mm, Professor Thomas Burri, who previously has come up with a model for evaluating, uh, evaluating autonomous weapon systems that operate in the kinetic realms and wanted to know uh, if and to which extent can the same model called the schema, can you perhaps introduce it a bit, be applied uh, to uh, disembodied systems? And what are the main obstacles and when are analogies rather sufficient? So welcome and the uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Anne. Um, this is not a, a very straightforward question. You know, uh, when I when I talk about this tool we developed to uh, assess um, robotic systems uh, in an ethical perspective, um, you know, when I usually when I introduce it, it takes me around two hours, and people are usually then very very confused. So here I have a couple of minutes um, that is bound to be not fully satisfactory. Um, but uh, look, I mean, the thing is, so when we came to this idea of evaluating cyber systems, autonomous cyber systems, um, it was very clear to us, us being myself and uh, my co-author, Daniel Trusillo, um, it was very clear to us that we brought some, let's say, significant experience. We're talking about five, six, seven years of, of, of working with autonomous physical embodied systems um, to this project. We have developed a tool, we call it the schema, which, um, you know, takes a very comprehensive look at autonomous systems in the security uh, field, uh, loosely said. And, uh, you know, this has a, a multiple steps, but one of the most important steps for this project here is to decide whether a system has autonomy, you know, in the first place. Is it an autonomous system? In our case, we talked about robots, autonomous robots. We took that and applied this to autonomous cyber capabilities. We had a notion, say, that relied on sort of five composite elements um, to, uh, to determine whether a ro robot was autonomous. And of these elements, which, you know, uh, broadly are based on the question, look, is this thing you're looking at, is it autarkic? Has it autarky? Is it independent from energy? Is it independent from human control? Does it learn? Does it interact with the environment? In, with the environment, and is it, uh, is it mobile? Does it move? So these five factors for us, for a physical system, determined whether the thing we're looking at is an autonomous system. Now, for cyber systems, like, these criterions make sense, but only to a certain extent. You can't really consider whether a cyber system is autonomous in the sense that it has autarky independent from energy source. If it doesn't have energy, a cyber system, at least as far as I know, uh, can't survive. So, <laughs> survive, in a, in a, in a, of course, in a, in, a, in a metaphorical sense, so to speak. And it also doesn't make too much sense um, to say whether it is mobile, you know, does it move around? <laughs> that doesn't make too much sense. You can look at whether it learns, does it have machine learning? And that, of course, links to the question, is it an artificial intelligence, which, again, is one of those other subgroups which, uh, you know, develops, evolves largely parallel to the discussion about autonomous weapon systems and the cyber discussion. Does it have artificial intelligence? And then mostly, um, is it uh, subject to some sort of adequate human control? And that, of course, is a bridge to the situation or the discussion we have in Geneva. So... Essentially, when we look at autonomous cyber systems, we are almost thrown back on this very central notion of, is it subject to some adequate level of control? 
this is a, it's obviously an open discussion, but we can say that the, that the CCW has discussed this notion whether and when something is subject to adequate human control for almost seven years now. And it has come to, let's say, um, a rather minimal consensus for the cyber or cyber realm, if you like, cyberspace, um, we have to see whether the whether there's uh, it's easier to achieve consensus. Our experience for CCWs tells us well it's not, um, but that doesn't mean we don't have to have the conversation. I leave it uh, here for the moment. Um, maybe I could say more during the discussion. Then back to you, Anne. Yeah, but definitely coming back to many of the facets that you just briefly flew by right now because uh, um, they are so uh, substantial to the whole uh, to the whole debate but uh, moving on to professor Rerik Jensen then uh, as uh, reiterated uh, by the mm, previous two speakers and by thousands of others then the core of all these debates and that uh, creates uh, this quiet uh, and misunderstanding is the may I say, shifting notion of what, in fact, uh, uh, constitutes uh, human control. But uh, if uh, we, for a second, leave the technical and ethical issues aside, then uh, what does international law, uh, law of countermeasures, uh, you said Bellum, you said Bellum, what does international humanitarian law also has to have to say about these issues? So... Well, thank you. welcome. Thank you, Anne, and thank you for letting me uh, be here. I, I'm grateful to be a part of uh, SciCon. It's always the best uh, cyber conference each year, and I'm grateful to, to uh, be asked to participate. Uh, I was very grateful for Ryan's and, and Thomas's earlier remarks because I think they set up my uh, question quite well. This one of the one of the fundamental threshold questions is how we define autonomy, what we think autonomy means. And, and we have to at least embrace that question and understand it before we can then look at the legal restraints that might be in place on the use of autonomous weapon systems. And, and Ryan, along with uh, co-author Chris Jenks, have written a great article. Uh, this book has a great chapter uh, that will talk about that as well by Tim McFarland. Uh, there are lots of issues, fundamental threshold issues on how we define autonomy that I think are are important for us to make sure we understand when we get to the legal question, because autonomy will inevitably be on the battlefield. There is no doubt about that. That 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 ship has already sailed in in the in to use the colloquial term. Uh, autonomy will be involved in logistics. It will be involved in data collection and compilation. It will be involved in intelligence gathering. It will be involved in analysis. Autonomous systems will be functioning on the battlefield in, a, in a, a, many, many different facets. So the, the type of autonomous system I want to focus on and that is important for my uh, chapter and my research is autonomous systems that are engaged in selecting and engaging targets. And this is where I think the, the most important questions and maybe the most difficult questions have arisen. Thomas mentioned the discussions that have been going on in Geneva at the, the certain conventional weapons convention state parties meetings. They've been going on for a long time. There is indeed uh, a, a great lack of meaningful consensus on this issue. But two major questions, I think, have emerged. And the first question is... What level of human control, if any, does the law require for autonomous weapons, including autonomous cyber weapons, that will select and engage targets? Again, the key here is the selecting and engaging targets. Autonomy will be involved in lots of other systems, but when that system begins to select and engage targets, then the issue of what law applies, what legal constraints might apply to that situation becomes key. And then the second question would be, um, if no human control is required, what is the standard required for states to field such weapons? Uh, for example, does an autonomous weapon that selects and, engage and engages targets have to be 100% correct? Every case, never make a mistake. Or does it just have to be better than humans? Or is there some 
standard in the middle that will be acceptable for autonomous weapon systems to select and engage uh, targets. Let, let me deal uh, briefly with that first question. What level of human control, if any, does the law require, uh, including for autonomous weapon systems? And here we have some differing views, as Thomas has highlighted. There, there, are, uh, there are some elements, uh, some individuals, some organizations who argue that um, there, there must be some form of human control uh, in the system, and then there is a great uh, debate about where that, what, what that means, what that human involvement means. Does it mean at the time of selecting and engaging? Does it mean uh, somewhere in the life cycle that would uh, provide confidence in the weapon's ability to select and engage? And, and we can talk much more about this as we go through the presentation. My, my own personal view, and I will end with this, is that fixating on the amount of human control that is required in the employment of autonomous weapons, including autonomous cyber uh, capabilities, is really the wrong question with respect to autonomy. The question we should be asking ourselves or be focused on is whether or not the system, wherever the human control is or is not, can comply with the principles of the law of armed conflict. And that, to me, seems to be the more important question, and that should be the question that we should be focused on. Thanks, Anne. Back to you. Mm -hmm. And um, um, thank you. And as we saw, then it's not about losing control or it's not about uh, not having uh, any human element in the whole process, but it's rather about the um, shifting notion of control that we are not so much focusing on the very uh, limited exact moment of deployment, but uh, we are moving towards more abstract forms. But um, since uh, more abstract forms mean more complexity when interpreting uh, subjective issues such as intent or knowledge, then um, since uh, your chapter in fact uh, explored these issues, then uh, uh, Russell, perhaps I would ask um, you, uh, what are your views uh, of um, of the, what are your views of uh, um, the law as it currently stands? Does it in fact provide any interpretative means of overcoming the um, perceived uh, responsibility gap uh, when it comes to subjective elements in a context where control is abstract? Well, thank you very much, Anne, for that question. And thank you to yourself and the Centre and, and Ryan for uh, beginning this important project and bringing it to such a successful uh, conclusion. The chapter that I authored for the book was co-authored with a colleague of mine, Professor Nicholas Segorius, and we looked to uh, the doctrine of command responsibility and whether this doctrine can be leveraged in order to provide accountability where autonomous cyber weapons um, go forward and commit international crimes and perhaps more specifically um, war crimes. So I restrict my comments um, to the context of, of international criminal law. Now, of course, in the con context of international criminal law, individuals commit crimes um, uh, where they do so with the requisite uh, actus reus and mens reus. And the actus reus there is you know, the, the guilty crime, so the war crime, the targeting of civilians or civilian objects. And the mens rea is um, that that act has been committed with uh, intent or knowledge under Article 30 of the Rome Statute establishing the International Criminal Court. And the Rome Statute has really become the focus um, of our debates around um, international criminal law in, in recent years. Um, now, it may be the case that um, uh, an individual that deploys an autonomous cyber weapon um, does so um, in a way that meets um, the, the actus reus and the mens rea of a particular crime, for example, a war crime. Um, so that autonomous cyber weapon um, can be deployed into an environment in which the uh, the operator is aware, knows, it's reasonably likely um, that that uh, particular uh, weapon um, may misidentify a, um, a civilian object as a, a military object and engage um, and, and target it. Now, if that's the case, then, uh, as I say, the, the, the actus reus and the mens rea of the particular crime, the war crime, will, will be present. And the operator could be held responsible um, as a, a perpetrator of an international crime. The problem, however, is that as you move along the continuum of autonomy, 
Um, and as uh, autonomous weapons become uh, or start to be deployed into very complex and dynamic and um, um, changing uh, environments, it's often quite difficult to say that the, the actus res and the mens rea of, for example, a war crime has been um, uh, committed. I mean, how can it be said that um, uh, the operator that deployed a truly autonomous cyber weapon into um, you know, this unstable and ever-changing environment um, did so with in, intent or knowledge. I think that's, that, that, that's very difficult to um, establish. So what we try to do in, in, in our chapter is to think um, a bit more broadly and to think a bit more constructively about whether there are other rules of international law, and in particular uh, international criminal law, that can be used to, to, to provide a, a accountability um, and impose responsibility um, where autonomous uh, cyber weapons do commit um, in, in international crimes. As I say, we look to uh, the doctrine here of command responsibility, which is very well established in uh, military doctrine, in humanitarian law, but as I say, also uh, in, in international criminal law. And Article 28 of the Rome Statute has become the, the, the focus there. So I won't go through the different criteria that are, are needed, but um, you know, there, there, there are a number of recognised um, um, tenets of the doctrine of, of command responsibility. And in our chapter, we look through those different um, tenets and see whether or not they can be established in uh, the context of um, autonomous cyber weapons, when those cyber weapons go on to commit, uh, for example, war crimes. In essence, you know, we say that um, um, command responsibility can be uh, utilised um, in, in the context of autonomous um, cyber uh, weapons, that these particular features and conditions of command responsibility can be met, um, although the caveat there is as autonomous cyber weapons move along that autonomy continuum, for example, where they're embedded with um, artificial intelligence, and they can truly be saying to mimic um, um, human intelligence, then perhaps um, the, the doctrine of command responsibility becomes more difficult uh, to, to apply. So, um, yes, I think I'll, I'll leave it there and, and pass back to you, and thank you. And thank you, and as we saw, really, that uh, um, the book, one of the nicest features there is, in fact, that uh, it turned out to be strongly solution-focused in a way that the majority of the authors really suggested different ways of overcoming the perceived uh, mm, responsibility gap, for instance, or, or uh, the perceived lack of uh, administrative oversight and control or parliamentary control and accountability. And uh, uh, one of the other authors uh, um, writing about issues um, surrounding international criminal law also suggested that perhaps when a um, system is being uh, uh, systematically misused by a state, then uh, we shouldn't focus so much on uh, criminal law that uh, uh, involves a heavy subjective element, but we should in fact, go and plain, plain and simple apply uh, the law of state responsibility, which is less problematic when it comes to automatic, you know, autonomous systems as such. But um, coming back, uh, or or uh, rather not moving f um, f further from the concept of control, then. Uh, um, as mentioned, there are many venues and alternatives to, in fact, gaining or holding some kind of control. And uh, some of them might be prior intelligence before uh, selecting or engaging the target. Uh, there has to be a certain amount of information gathered in a very diligent manner before. And uh, uh, also integrated technical constraints, uh, for instance, uh, geographical or temporal or uh, uh, kill switch. And uh, um, also uh, instruments uh, um, akin to uh, those applied to intelligence, like intelligence oversight committees, uh, and uh, mm, also uh, uh, to borrow from um, mm, to borrow from state practices of uh, how uh, uh, how uh, use of force is being approved. Then, uh, uh, what uh, this goes to all of the panelists right now, then uh, uh, what uh, of these and uh, all the other uh, uh, measures of uh, 
gaining or exercising control sound uh, the most feasible to your ear and uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of uh, all of them so just but of course there was no exhaustive, exhaustive list presented right now so you are free to think and uh, mm, so Ryan maybe any thoughts on this matter sure uh, perhaps one of the most important starting points is that um, autonomy doesn't mean a lack of control. Uh, I think this myth is based on the understanding of control as the ability to directly manipulate with the system in real time. However, there are various other ways in which one can influence the effects that a particular capability achieves, whether that capability be a, a cyber capability uh, or a, um, a kinetic uh, capability. So something that uh, the Australian government has um, uh, highlighted in the context of the autonomous weapon systems debate, and this, that is perhaps relevant here as well, is the idea of a system of control, which is that throughout the life cycle of a particular capability, there are various touch points at which human beings can influence the way in which that particular capability operates and the effects that it has uh, when deployed. Uh, this starts from the conceptualization to the design, to the programming, to the testing, to the deployment, to the review, the after action review, to accountability measures and so on and so forth. So particularly with autonomous capabilities, again, whether cyber or kinetic, there is an increased need to look at this whole range of control measures that can be taken that influence the, uh, uh, the, the outcome of a particular operation. And the result of this perhaps is that even though the operator of the system still has a very particular responsibility under the law, as the law prescribes specific responsibilities for those who uh, decide upon uh, and plan attacks, um, there are various other people who can have an impact on whether the, uh, the system com complies with the law, whether its use uh, uh, complies uh, with the law. And from that perspective, perhaps um, a testing and evaluation of the system becomes particularly uh, critical. Uh, and, and I think uh, uh, from that perspective, the contribution that uh, Alec Tattersall and Ju uh, Damien Copeland have made to the book on applying um, weapons review processes to cyber capabilities and autonomous cyber capabilities um, is particularly significant. Um, there are already challenges involved in um, legally reviewing um, uh, cyber capabilities and autonomy uh, adds a sort of an, an, ex, uh, an additional uh, uh, level of complexity to that. Uh, but perhaps to, to sum up, um, I think it's important to note that there is no specific type of control that the law would require. I would argue that what the law requires is that such human control be exercised as may be necessary to achieve compliance with the law. In some circumstances, that control is more likely to be um, exercised by the operator of the system. In other circumstances, that control is more likely to be exercised by those who design and test the system. Thank you. And uh, uh, coming back to the issue of weapons reviews, and when should they take place? Uh, should they be continuous or one-off procedures, for instance? And should they uh, uh, involve also after-action reviews? And uh, uh, when is, in fact, when does the um, moment of uh, deploying a cyber capability happen? Then. Um, mm, because of these particularities, then weapons reviews really are, on one hand, the key to balancing the slightly unconventionally abstract notion of control. And, but on the other hand, it's extremely complicated. And I also recall that, uh, um, I also recall that uh, uh, Thomas, in your chapter, weapons reviews were mentioned and uh, briefly uh, analysed, and also in Eric's chapter. And, uh, do you have uh, any viewpoints that you would like to share as to the um, as to the uh, complications that one might 
uh, face when uh, trying to work out a uh, foolproof procedure of reviewing um, capabilities such as uh, autonomous ca cyber capabilities. So, uh, first, um, mm, Eric, are you there? I am, and uh, and I think uh, what Ryan said was really important about this exercise of control. The, the UK has made a great statement about control needs to be thought about over the life cycle of the system, not at one particular moment in the system's execution. And you might you might think of this as contrasting control in selecting and engaging targets as opposed to control on the selection and engagement of targets. And uh, Ryan's point that the, the real goal is to get to compliance with the LOAC, that's what the weapons review is designed to do, is to make sure that when the weapon is used or when the weapon is uh, takes uh, has an effect in combat, that that effect is in compliance with the law of armed conflict. If we try and limit control to the moment where selection and engaging takes place, we are really limiting the value of the speed and the precision and the things mentioned earlier uh, in this conference that come with autonomous weapon systems. Just one example, one of the autonomous weapon systems that currently is uh, being used is called the CRAM. And it's basically a land-based system that is designed to engage incoming artillery and destroy that artillery shell before it lands and does its damage. The mathematical calculations and the, the science required to intercept the parabolic uh, flight path of that incoming missile could never be done by a human in the time that it would have to be done to happen. So you, could have, you couldn't even have the machine do all the math and spit it out to a human and say, now you confirm that. Um, so that then I can launch my anti-rocket missile. That, that there just isn't the time to do that. Rather, that system, because it's autonomous and can engage that incoming missile on its own, do all the math on its own, and and the and then launch its anti-rocket, its anti-missile rocket, is what makes that weapon system effective. The control to make that weapon system comply with the LOAC happens long before the actual selection and engagement, and that's what the weapons review should consider. In the end, when the effect happens, has there been sufficient input to make sure that that weapon system can comply with the LOAC when it actually selects and engages? But should we um, look forward to some kind of um, universal, uh, uniform guidelines to how to conduct weapons reviews when it comes to technologies like this because uh, the landscape of uh, state practices and uh, uh, state um, and, uh, and and different regulations is a very secretive and b uh, very scattered so should this perhaps be a field that uh, would benefit from more uh, black and white clarity Well, I think that there are some uh, publications, for example, the U.S. Department of Defense has published an example of what a weapons review is, uh, how they uh, apply weapons review and what things they consider. So I think that there could be more clarity, but the, the basic concept is that much must comply with the LOAC, the principles that we all know uh, apply to the LOAC. Um, that's, that's what I would say. Thomas, I, I'm sure you have some views on that as well. Yes, I do. I'm not, just not sure whether I'm on. Yes, you are. Okay, good. Yes, no, I mean, look, uh, I, I think we all agree that the uh, Article, Article 36 weapons review is key here. And I'm not so particularly worried about the weapons review. Yes, it's secretive. We don't really know what the states are doing, or most of the states are doing, fully clear. Um, but it's not, you know, in the weapons review, in my understanding, you know, you look at a weapon and you look at what it can do and you look what it needs to, to be doing in order to comply with the IHL and then you clear it and then you can't just, you know, let it evolve and do something else, do a little machine learning. No, then you have to go back, you know, you go back to the beginning and do an additional review. So I'm not so worried about that, uh, about that uh, particular sort of point in time where you release it later on, that's not so much my worry. Of course, I mean, I, I read from, from Rain and, and from, uh, from Eric, of course, the, uh, 
you know, the question is, what does control mean so that we can apply it in the weapons review? Is it, as Ryan seemed to suggest, some sort of a meta notion that kind of extends into all aspects of the weapon? Um, with the risk that ultimately it just means please comply with IHL, which is not very much. I mean, a, a huge expectation, but, you know, we were looking for the, the answer to the question, what does that mean, when we brought up the notion of meaningful human control. Um, you know, or, or, that, or can we narrow it down, sort of, you know, in a sense of a controller, you know, a joystick, we know that controls something, and that's it. You know, it doesn't extend to the question when you, for instance, have a machine learning system, and these systems are kind of hard to explain. Um, it doesn't, for instance, mean that you only have control over the system when you can actually say, you know, I can explain it. It's explainable. It's interpretable. Does that notion of interpretability, interpretability actually figure in the notion of control? And that's not, you know, in a sense, not an academic example. You know, when you have a, a defensive weapon system that you know, learns to shoot down like incoming missiles, whatever. And, you know, it's so good, as Eric uh, suggested, that you can't really control it manually, so to speak, in real time. It's so good that it just shoots down the right things, but you don't really know why, and you can't really explain why, and you can't really interpret it. Um, is that still human control? Can you just say, well, you know, we don't really know what it's doing, but it has proven pretty effective 90.9% .9 of the time, or maybe 90.9.9%. .9 is that enough? Is that enough for us to control that system? These are the notions we have to confront, and these notions, in a sense, also arise in cyberspace, of course. Um, they're in some regards, they're less complicated, and in other, in other regards, they're more complicated. Um, that's about as much as I can say for the moment. And uh, uh, Eric, uh, maybe something as a response to a slightly differing view here, or only marginally different. Um, so I, I, I don't think there's anything in what Thomas said that I would disagree with, um, except maybe um, the fundamental requirement of human control. We might differ a little bit on how we think that human control First of all, it's it, the legality of the need for human control and then how it might fit into that system. But I agree with him that uh, the, the weapons review is not really problematic in the sense that we can, we can uh, analyze the application of the weapon system and figure out how it performs. He, Thomas does raise a really great question, which hopefully we'll come to at some point, which is what level of effect or what level of success in applying that, uh, the, the principles of the LOAC are required of an autonomous system versus a human, for example. And um, um, thank you. And uh, also, in uh, one of the chapters authored by Professor Peter Margulies, it was um, brought out that the prior intelligence might be uh, one way of uh, mitigating the risks, then uh, I'm looking to you, Russell, right now, since uh, you have devoted um, a large share of your uh, uh, academic work so far to cyber espionage, then would you agree that in some cases um, the necessity to uh, have control over an autonomous system in fact uh, raises uh, espionage from the status of a necessary evil to this of a uh, necessary precondition of proportionality, for instance? Yes, I mean, very good, very good question, Anne. I mean, it's certainly when you move towards the, the law of armed conflict, you know, different, very different rules apply, in my opinion, um, than they would during uh, peacetime. I largely see there being quite a number of prohibitive rules applicable to cyber espionage and autonomous uh, cyber espionage um, under the peacetime law. Whereas as you move to the law of armed conflict, as I say, a, you know, a different regime obviously applies. And, you know, th there's no doubt about it that parties to armed conflicts can um, gather intelligence on their enemies. Um, and as I say, that's very well established going back at least as far as um, the Libra Code, but through the Brussels Declaration and the Hague Regulations. And um, if states look to use autonomous cyber capabilities to augment their intelligence collection efforts, then I don't see um, you know, that, that 
uh, addition of autonomy there being uh, creating any you know brand new uh, legal uh, questions. Of course, um, when intelligence collection is conducted um, autonomously or through autonomous systems, um, you know perhaps there are additional risks there, and some of those risks could be, for example, that um, uh, you know the intelligence collection hoovers up huge amounts of um, uh, information, and suddenly the information being collected isn't necessarily on the enemy, but is perhaps against you know ordinary civilians, um, which you know in my view would be the um, you know the concurrent application of, of peacetime law with uh, or in human rights law, for example, with the law of armed conflict would apply there. So if the information collected doesn't have a nexus to the prosecution of the armed conflict, then then peacetime law would apply. But also, of course, you know, it, it may be that the, the autonomous system collects information um, that goes beyond the cyber infrastructure of the um, of, of, of the adversary or, or, or the opponent, um, you know, and strays on to the, the cyber infrastructure of, of third states or perhaps neutral states. Um, you know, which raises a host of um, difficult questions about the, the law of neutrality and um, whether that neutral state becomes a co-belligerent and that's a party to the armed conflict. Um, so, yes, I mean, my position there would probably be the same as it is on, you know, most issues related to autonomy. I don't think it creates any brand new um, uh, legal issues, but it does complexify and intensify some of the existing problems that we, we would otherwise um, that we would otherwise find. And uh, thank you. And uh, you also mentioned uh, mm, a particular feature of the cyber environment is that it does not recognize political borders and uh, propagates uh, uh, in a speedy manner and at the uh, lowest possible cost, for instance. And it uh, in a way, it's once out, it's hard to call back. This is a, um, and it's also a very dynamic environment. And uh, mm, this is related to the uh, very prevalent uh, fear of unpredictability is that A, the weapon system is uh, uh, unpredictable because of some of its features and uh, second, the very operational environment is arguably the most unpredictable. So. Uh, um, I've read uh, different positions on this one uh, from uh, from uh, our book and elsewhere. But uh, what are your views on the inherent the unpredictability and uh, the um, and um, mm, statements that there is no uh, equally unpredictable environment? Uh, so, uh, is it really that? Uh, that bad, or perhaps even uh, the cyber domain helps to mitigate some of the concerns uh, uh, related to unpredictability. So, uh, Russell, maybe some thoughts about the. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you know, the, the, the adjective Ryan used to describe um, autonomous, um, or the, some of the discussions around autonomous weapons um, uh, is appropriate, you know, that there is this myth. That they are in somehow divorced from human control, um, and you know, the reality is is that you know at a very minimum um, these autonomous um, cyber weapons or cyber capabilities are given life by the fact that they are uh, human made. So they will be powered by algorithms, for example, um, that have been written uh, and coded by by humans. Um, often, you know, in collaboration with the private sector, they if you say they've been tested, um, but also in addition those weapons will be deployed into um, particular uh, environments. And I think the analogy there with, with kinetic weapons or conventional weapons is, is very close. Uh, a commander, for example, will always have to um, judge distances, wind speeds, um, the weight of weapons, the blast radius, and can use different types of technology to estimate the blast radius depending on the weapons used and the munitions and all of these types of things. I think that applies with equal force to, to, to the cyber setting. Yes, there can be you know, it can be more difficult. Yes, perhaps the testing, um, uh, you know, need, needs to be uh, more intensive um, or, or more specific. Um, and, uh, you know, it, perhaps the level of control that's exercised as the as, as the weapon um, enters into the operational domain. Also, uh, you know, there needs to be more supervision or the kill switch needs to be, um, you know, available or, or, or all of these uh, types of things. Um, so, yes, I, I, I don't see... Um, uh, cyber weapons or autonomous cyber weapons being 
so unpredictable as to preclude their use under, under international law. I just think that more care and responsibility is needed in the way in which they are developed and into the, the environments in which they're deployed. And, and international was obviously an important guide there in that, in that context. Yeah, thank you. And uh, uh, as I remember, then uh, uh, you, Thomas, uh, alongside uh, Daniel Trusillo, in your chapter, you also took a rather lukewarm position uh, to the statements regarding the um, unprecedented uh, unpredictability of uh, the cyber environment, uh, claiming that there are natural environments that are, in fact, uh, at least equally unpredictable and harsh. So uh, maybe a few uh, thoughts about this one from your side. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Anne. Um, I wasn't aware that our position was lukewarm, but <laughs> I take it that you mean uh, that we did take a firm position on this. Um, yes, I mean, I, I'd say, look, uh, predictability in a sense is, uh, you know, a, a, a problem that is really present when you have like these new machine learning systems, AI systems, you know, a kind of crunch huge amount of data and then they, they do something which is really hard to predict. And in a sense, that's okay because that's precisely the reason why we have these systems because we want them to figure out something from the data which we can't figure out ourselves. In the physical environment, an embodied weapon system, so to speak, this problem is not so, let's say in this classic artificial intelligence sense, is not so uh, present because, you know, in a sense, having an unpredictable physical weapon system is precisely the opposite of what any kind of uh, sane military person would want. You know, you would always want to be in control, you would want to know, you know, uh, what will it do? So the worst case will be, you know, you send it in and it does something you didn't predict. So there's a natural incentive and a tendency to avoid that situation, you know, if you're in a sense of a, a good faith actor, in, uh, you know, who's looking for compliance with international law and so on and so forth. And so on, so on. Uh, if you're a bad faith actor, it's a completely different story. Um, with the online case, the cyber capabilities... Um, since there is no embodiment, and, you know, there is no this, this natural uh, hesitancy to go into a physical situation and, and, and uh, do something that has real world consequences. But you just, you know, you, you send this thing online, this algorithm, maybe there's a little bit of a less of a, of a, of a natural barrier to, uh, to, you know, to make things as unpredictable as possible. That's something I see, but honestly, I think... That sense we don't know enough about autonomous cyber capabilities to really judge, you know, whether they do something that can be uh, unpredictable. My feeling about, you know, algorithms, coding and everything, um, you know, things are more predictable than we might actually uh, um, uh, fear that they are. And um, thank you, but so far, it has been the case, uh, and it does not come as a surprise to anyone who has, for instance, read the working paper that uh, um, we seem to agree that autonomy does not add a whole set of new legal problems. It maybe amplifies some of the existing ones, but and, and also majority of the talk here or uh, uh, the scholarly writing on this issue can with some modification be nicely applied uh, to just cyber capabilities or on the other hand some of it to just autonomous weapon systems but uh, what in your view this also resonates nicely uh, with one of the questions that we have received from the audience uh, what in your view is that uh, is the one thing that makes autonomous cyber capabilities truly special and intricate from the legal point of view and uh, um, so that uh, we really have to, in a way, overthink what we have learned so far about conventional cyber operations and as they, uh, and, uh, as they are used during uh, armed conflict. And uh, also uh, mm, re-evaluate what we know about uh, kinetic autonomous weapon systems. So what makes autonomous cyber capabilities truly special? One distinguishing feature, mm, Rain. You with us? Well, thanks. I, I get the easy questions. Um, 
Look, I, I think that one of the, uh, the, the really interesting things is that particularly defensive autonomous cyber capabilities are systems that potentially need to be able to operate within different legal frameworks. So if you have a defensive cap cyber capability which protects your network and you switch it on in time of peace and you keep it switched on in time of armed conflict, it must be able to operate in a way that complies both with, re with the regime that applies during peacetime and the regime that applies in time of an armed conflict. That is normally not the case with autonomous weapon systems, which assume that uh, there is an armed conflict uh, when they are switched on, or uh, an autonomous uh, offensive cyber capability, which is deployed in a particular context such that we know uh, what the, the legal framework is. So I think from that perspective, autonomous defensive cyber capabilities uh, pose an interesting uh, uh, conundrum, and they basically have to be designed so that they can comply with the law that is effectively the, that, that sets the highest bar uh, um, uh, to, um, um, to, to the use of, of an offensive capability. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And for instance, uh, when it comes to uh, data collection and uh, cyber capabilities are, in the end of the day, still made up of data, then the highest bar is oftentimes set by peacetime law. And now coming back to you, Russell, mm, you mentioned that uh, 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 in the framework of uh, IHL, uh, espionage, not forbidden, but... Uh, when the data is being collected for in, during peacetime, for instance, but put to use during uh, an armed conflict in a, let's say, in a seamless uh, uh, integrated way mm, through the use of a particular, particular software, autonomous or not. Yes, I mean, I, I, you know, as Ryan said, you know, the, the distinction between uh, the law of peace and the law of armed conflict not is is not as um, stark or as binary as it once was, and you know there can be the concurrent applications of those of those frameworks, you know, depending on a, a variety of, of, of different factors. I mean, the, you know, the, the issue for me under the you know, the law of peace times that you know, whether or not the the information be, can be collected, and you know that's that that's the critical issue, and whether it runs into conflict with principles, general principles such as sovereignty. Uh, whether it's specific regimes such as human rights law, um, but but when it comes to the, the passing of that that data and being used in the in in the context of armed conflict, I think you know what's really important there is the way in which that intelligence is put into action, the way in which it's used. So, um, as Eric has said already, um, you know that there can be you know there are important rules around targeting, um, you know around distinction, around proportionality, around precautions in attack. So, you know that intelligence can be used to inform that process, but of course there can be mistakes in the context in this context as well. Um, and you know those mistakes th those mistakes can also lead through to violations of uh, in international humanitarian laws. So I think you know the takeaway point here is that you know states have to be very careful in the way in which they collect intelligence, but also the way in which they in they use it. So they have to ensure its probity, they have to ensure its reliability, they have to ensure that if it's been passed to them, that you know it's compatible with you know, certain rules, whether it could be national rules on uh, sharing of intelligence, whether it's international rules around shares of intelligence, which of course international human, human rights law says quite a lot about. So, you know, it's a precarious environment in, in which states have to, to, to operate. But, you know, what's really important is that they're cognizant of their of, 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 the, of their legal obligations and of how they apply in, in, in particular contexts. And uh, thank you. And uh, now um, I would like to hear about the one distinguishing feature uh, from Eric's perspective. What makes uh, autonomous cyber capabilities special from an, for an international lawyer? So if, if I can, and I hope you won't mind, I just want to make a couple of comments back on predictability yeah, sure. and then I will come to your question. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that we don't know why uh, an autonomous system will do what it does doesn't mean it's unpredictable. It may be very predictable, even if we don't understand why. And I think that's a that's a big point. Um, Thomas's point about commanders wanting predictability is absolutely true. 
no commander wants to employ a system that is unpredictable. And so that will become a very important point as we field autonomous systems, including autonomous weapon systems and, and cyber autonomous systems. And then the last point is, um, having been a legal advisor to commanders during actual armed conflict, um, humans are not that predictable. If they were, Russell wouldn't be studying international criminal law. You know, governments usually don't send their militaries out with the intent to commit war crimes. Those are unpredictable actions by humans. Uh, so th this idea of predictability, in some senses, deserves a lot more attention and a lot more focus rather than than just in most in more broad terms. Now, with respect to what makes cyber autonomous weapons truly special, I think for me, the, 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 there are many uh, things, but the, maybe the one key point is this idea of speed and precision. Um, cyber capabilities will allow us to uh, get to targets and effects in ways that humans just can't do in that kind of time and with that kind of precision. Mm -hmm. And um, now, this is the popular question, but uh, I'm, uh, mm, I'm curious about the one distinguishing feature according to Thomas. Um, look, I mean, uh, now I'm a bit at the tail end of the, of the question, which, which is fine with me, but, you know, if you ask me what is the, the main difference of the distinguishing feature, it's, you know, a cyber system lacks a body. <laughs> and an autonomous weapon system has a body. And that has, in a sense, leads to everything the others said, you know, in, in a, when there's a body, you know, it's, it's somehow easier to distinguish, is it IHL, is it a non-conflict, or is it peacetime, you know? Um, when there is no body, um, things are more rapid. The, the, the whole system becomes extremely rapid. Why? Because it's not hindered by the body. It doesn't have to interact with the environment in a physical sense. And so it doesn't have to actuate in, 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 the, in, the, in the language that hypothesists speak. Um, so it, it sounds rather trivial, uh, uh, but the fact that, it, that uh, you know, cyber capabilities, and especially autonomous cyber capabilities, of course, do not necessarily travel physically is, the, is, is of course, the, the main difference. But that, in a sense, is more stating the problem than giving the solution. I'm fully aware of this. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, this leads us again to the many reasons why these two uh, conversations should in fact uh, go hand in hand or at least in the same assembly halls because uh, oh, when talking about autonomy and overlooking uh, um, these autonomous technologies that are disembodied, but for this reason, um, especially, uh, especially covert and uh, reluctant to any kind of oversight, for instance, then we might end up with uh, we might end up with problems later on. And um, but when you think back about the book and uh, the process of uh, writing your contribution and reviewing uh, those of the other authors, then um, is there something, is this question of course goes to uh, all of the panelists, is there something that you felt that you would like to explore in more depth in the future and something that, you know, there is always this uh, uh, missing two days in the end, that you, uh, all of a sudden you feel inspired about the thing that uh, felt a bit uh, um, marginal in the beginning, but, and then uh, mm, there is no time left anymore. So. Uh, what is your topic? What would you like to explore further in the field of autonomous cyber capability and international law? So um, I think, yeah, Thomas. Thank you, Anne. Um, I mean, uh, you know, if, if, if I'm, I'm not sure you, whether you really asked me whether we want to go to Tallinn, you know, and be physically present for a conference. The answer, I think, from all the panelists and from everyone in the book, of course, is a resounding yes. <laughs> and there, if you ask me, you know, we would have to, in a sense, uh, discuss this overlap, you know, between these two worlds we have discussed now. I mean, now, in a sense, you know, we have talked a lot about autonomous weapon systems, the, the physical world where IHL clearly applies and everything, and then there's the cyber world. But it so happens that these two uh, fields or domains or 
worlds, if you like, uh, are not entirely separate. They merge, you know, and, and, and uh, when you, when, especially when you have some sort of an attack, you will want to use one and the other end at the same time. And that, of course, creates new problems, uh, which we, we, of course, haven't really understood yet. And then there's also the overlap. Uh, Ryan has already mentioned, you know, the fact that uh, cyber systems tend to, in a sense, to, to phase into peacetime. And it's not really clear whether, you know, when they are applied, it's really part of an armed conflict. So it's not really clear whether IHL applies. So you fall back on, on international human rights law where you do have some norms about data collection, you know, I mean, when you do facial recognition, you gather personal data, biometric recognition in general, um, then human rights law has a lot to say about this. Um, you know, can you do facial recognition in, in, in you know, an acerbated sense and so on and so forth. So there's a lot going on in the, in the peacetime uh, uh, law, if you like. And that, with cyber system, that kind of, you know, merges with the, you know, that other body of law, which is IHL, much more evidently than, than, than is the case in physical systems. So I think we should probably explore this, and we probably have, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, topics to, to discuss you know, for a two-day workshop. And... Um, mm. Ryan, do you agree or do you have any ideas for Autonomous Cyber Capabilities 2.0? <laughs> well, look, I, I think that there are a number of contributions to this book that could be developed into a research project um, in their own right. Uh, perhaps the one that really fascinates me is what Eric's uh, chapter focused on and that Peter's chapter uh, touched upon uh, to some degree as well. Um, which is precautionary measures. You know, Articles 57 and 58 of Additional Protocol 1 uh, to the Geneva Conventions um, and the rich range of legal obligations that these provisions create uh, and, and how they apply in the context of autonomous uh, cyber capabilities. Uh, so, so what does it mean to take constant care of the civilian population whilst using an autonomous uh, capability? Uh, what kind of precautionary measures can potentially be delegated to uh, an autonomous uh, capability? Uh, what precautionary measures have to be taken by a human being before deploying uh, an autonomous uh, capability? Um, I, I think I, I wasn't terribly optimistic a, a, about the ability of autonomous systems to comply with uh, the precautionary measures requirement, but. Uh, um, Eric, Eric's piece has instilled some optimism in me, so that's something that I would, would like to uh, explore further. And I think that the, the question about the accountability gap um, is an interesting one as well. Um, and I think the contributions to this book suggest that the accountability gap is perhaps somewhat overstated in existing literature. Um, and, and I think that's an interesting uh, uh, issue to, to tease out Further. And uh, uh, does any of it uh, sound inspiring to um, Eric, for instance, to collaborate with Ryan and uh, furthermore uh, outline how m actual feasible precautions might look like when uh, uh, applying uh, autonomous cyber capabilities or any other topic? Yes, well, having had Ryan's endorsement, I should just be quiet because nothing I could say would be more persuasive uh, than that. Uh, but but I, I do think that the next step in those questions, or, or maybe a piece of those questions, is the standard of review. When, when we start to look at um, how autonomous systems can comply, what is the standard of review? Must these autonomous weapon systems be perfect? Do we compare them with with the data we have, which is very scant on how humans perform in these precautionary measures. You know, what is the standard of review by which we will then say, okay, now that autonomous weapon system is good enough to be employed. I think that really could uh, could use some development. And then just one other point that, that uh, goes to, to Russell's expertise. This idea of data has been really interesting uh, and, and how we use data and the corruption of data and how you might uh, you know, trust in data 
versus espionage and sabotage. I think those are some really interesting questions as well. And and uh, I obviously love everything Russell writes. That the book on cyber espionage is fantastic. But it makes me think about those kinds of questions that I think will be more and more important if we ever go into a large scale uh, armed conflict where cyber tools are engaged. May I uh, now, not uh, in a somewhat uh, um, organic way, proceed to give the mic to Russell to add anything and introduce his ideas for further research on this matter or related matters? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, well, leading on from um, Ed and there's perhaps a bit of selfless um, uh, promotion for both the NATO side of itself, but uh, as you know, um, uh, Dr. Azaf Lubin and, and myself are leading a new project for the NATO Cyber Center on the right to uh, data protection during times of armed conflict. And you know, the, the right to data protection in times of armed conflict, I think, is often eclipsed or dwarfed or crowded out um, by kind of more you know, military considerations um, and you know, other areas of, of international humanitarian law. But of course, you know, there is a right to data uh, protection during times of armed conflict, and it manifests itself in different areas. POWs, for example, or um, in the way in which intelligence is collected and used for targeting decisions, or the way in which peacekeeping operations, or the way in which war crimes trials, and you know, we can go on and on on this and all these different examples of the way in which the rights to data protection is, is really important um, during times of armed conflict. And I think uh, if you put the autonomous cyber debate uh, into the mix there, then lots of those um, already unexplored questions become even more difficult. Um, and, you know, I think those the, those questions are critically important to, to, to answer. And hopefully the project um, that Azaf and myself um, are, are doing with the, the NATO Cyber Centre um, will go some way to, to, towards answering them. But uh, just to say, um, you know, the project's in its early stages at the moment, but issues around autonomy and um, cyber um, autonomous capabilities will be addressed in, 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 in the, the edited collection in the project. Um, and to that extent, you know, it's kind of a natural progression on from, 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 from the project that you've done with Brian. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your thoughts and really probably um, leaving, thankfully, more questions than a full and, uh, um, a full and ready-made 100% uh, proof answers. So, and, uh, right now I'm going to move on to a slightly uh, weird experience of disembodied questions and answers. Um, so far, uh, we have received one question that comes back to control and reviews. This regards testing. And... Um, mm, the participant is asking to what extent can testing, uh, for example, as part of weapons reviews, be trusted when it comes to systems built on machine learning, um, especially for a system that is continuously learning. Uh, may I uh, direct this question to Eric? Yes, and I think it's a great question and something that we need to really think about hard. But, but I would start by saying, in, that, in, in one sense, this is no different than the human, right? We, we get a human, we, we put him or her in the military as a private, we send them out into armed conflict, and they absolutely learn. And what do we do with their learning and adaptation? We bring them back from time to time. We review the law of armed conflict. We review their practices, their processes, what they're thinking, and then we send them back out again. And, and no doubt we will have to do something like this with autonomous weapon systems. We will, in, we will engage them and utilize them in armed conflict. We will review how they do, and then we will bring them back and tinker and adjust and make corrections as needed. So I think it's an important question, but I don't think it's an unanswerable question. I don't think it's a bridge too far. I don't think it, it is really anything that detracts from our use of autonomous weapons. It just highlights the fact that, like with humans, we need to continuously review and update and make sure that it is functioning as we desire it to. Does any of the other speakers uh, want to add anything to this one? Mm, yes, I can. Well, maybe you, Ren. Mm. Well, well, I, I would just make the addition. Uh, mm, alphabetically, Ryan. <laughs> So I would just make the observation that uh, uh, perhaps autonomous cyber capabilities uh, have some additional opportunities for testing compared to kinetic capabilities. 
So with kinetic abilities, you need to at some point put them in a natural environment and see how they perform there. Whereas an autonomous cyber capability, you can potentially test in a synth synthetically created or virtual environment, uh, and you can um, test it continuously, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of times. So, so perhaps uh, it could be said that autonomous cyber capabilities are more susceptible to comprehensive testing than autonomous uh, kinetic capabilities. And Thomas, uh, may I also uh, uh, yes. ask, can you please display question number three? Thank you, and please go on. Okay, um, look, I mean, the, the, you know, the... the the thing with the learning machine, the learning weapon, when it's a physical weapon, an autonomous weapon system is really not such a problem, you know, because, um, you know, the weapons review must just be understood in the sense that, you know, learning in the wild, adaptive systems in the true sense are precluded by the law. I mean, it's, and, and, and there's also a very strong incentive not to have learning systems that are, you know, that are out there learning the wild and adapting all the time because these systems can very easily be gamed, right? You can just, you know, modify the data and, you know, in a sense, feed it the data that you think will do, will do the trick and then all of a sudden it does something else. So in a sense, with physical systems, you know, learning systems that are learning in the wild as opposed to those that are actually frozen at the point in time where you do the weapons review, which may gather data, and then when you learn on the basis of that data, you have to go through the, the, the clearance again. So that's the whole thing you do with physical systems. With cyber systems, um, in a sense, there is maybe a, a sense that, you know, learning in the wild, live, so to speak, um, would be possible uh, more than, or would be more, let's say, acceptable than maybe with an autonomous weapon system in the, in, in the physical sense. That is possible. Um, but there also I would caution, I mean, uh, you know, learning in the wild is really uh, uh, something that is very, very risky and very, uh, you know, you need to be very, very careful when you let loose a system um, that is capable of learning and that it acts on the go, you know, and, and you know, while interacting with the, with the environment. Uh, this is something of a myth, of a myth with machine learning that, you know, commonly we don't distinguish sufficiently between systems that are frozen, that have been trained, and then are frozen, and then are, you know, in a sense, working on the basis of this learning in the past, and the systems that are learning on the go, which are much rarer, and which create uh, much, much, uh, much more significant problems. Anything to add on this one? Uh, we have, in fact, uh, received a question that's very closely related to um, the previous one, and this regards the responsible ways of testing autonomous uh, cyber capabilities since they tend to be custom tailored and can we really realistically imagine them being tested only on in cyber ranges and not on the very uh, targets that they are meant for in the end is it it would be probably ethical but is it realistic any thoughts Would it? Eric. I would just say to the extent that Stuxnet is an example of that, that's, if Stuxnet was designed to accomplish a specific thing and it did it, that seems to be a good example of a time when a cyber tool was tested in a range and then applied generally and applied uh, as it should have been. Thomas, mm -hmm. back to you, sir. <laughs> Well, I was just going to say, I'm not sure I got the answer fully, so <laughs> I'm going to ask and rephrase it. But obviously, Eric got it, so I'm fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe I got it. Maybe I didn't, Thomas. Can, oh, I, can uh, I just jump in there? I don't I know. Think what really... The question comes from the audience, so it's for them to decide. But in my opinion, you did get it. But yeah, come. Yeah, please, Russell. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't uh, uh, speak over the top of there. Um, I, I think what we've not mentioned so far is that in the context of the weapons review, the intersection with the private sector is going to be critically important. Um, I think the militaries are very familiar with, you know, regular, normal military grade weapons. And, you know, the testing to a certain extent of those weapons um, can be conducted, you know, much more in-house, if, if, 
if we can put it in that way. Whereas with the, 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 the cyber weapons, I think more than, than any other type of weapon, um, the role of the private sector will be really important there. And you know, because of the sort of black box nature of the weapons uh, review, um, um, you know, one wonders how closely militaries are liaising with the private sector and whether or not that is, a, is an effective relationship. Then one more question. Uh, uh, it concerns the line between offense and defense uh, uh, in cyber warfare or conduct of hostilities in general. And uh, is it uh, is this in some way further complicated by adding autonomy to the usual cyber mix, uh, the, making uh, the distinction between uh, offensive and defensive, that is? Any volunteers for this one? <laughs> there are more questions um, related to what does the uh, standard of, uh, of, of, of care mean when at the point where cyber meets autonomy and so on and so forth? I have a file with the questions that I'm going to send you afterwards. But uh, right now it seems to me that it is time to wrap it up. As previously mentioned, um, a fair reflection of the actual content and the actual diversity and richness of thought uh, between the covers of this book would uh, in fact hijack the whole cycle in 2020 and uh, involve at least 17 people around the table and uh, uh, many more among the participants. So thank you for uh, mm, giving such a mm, great a great overview and uh, and and, and uh, uh, managing to uh, summarize the main points and the main uh, controversies contained in this book. Um, the book should be online now. It is online under ccdcd.org slash publications, and uh, it contains. It contains uh, the names and affiliations of all the authors uh, <clears throat> who I cannot name right now since uh, it's, uh, it would be slightly robotic and we do not have the time as of now, but uh, the least that we could do is uh, to have an applause for all the authors involved and to Ryan, to Isabel and to Agnes in the end. So thank you so much and thank you for the speakers, for the authors, and for the organizer of Saikon. Thank you, and Thank you. Uh, read the book. <laughs>